So, Rosalie Ham, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you. <laughs> so, I'm calling this classic stitch and bitch. Um, it's the story of Tilly Dunnage, mm. who returns to Dungata. Is that how I say it? Dungata? Yeah, that's right. The, um, the fictional town in Victoria where she grew up and had a pretty rotten childhood. Mm. Uh, and she comes back and sort of um, refashions the town, as it were, the frumpy ladies mm. of Dungata. Were you a dressmaker when you came up with this scenario, or were you more interested in writing about the dynamics of a remote rural community? Um, my principal um, inspiration was the dynamics of a remote rural community. That was what I wanted to talk about. And I wanted to talk about hypocrisy and bigotry and vanity and competition. And so the perfect way to do that is through the way you look. Um, and my mother was a dressmaker, as, ah. as most mothers were back in my childhood, because there were, were no shops. And I would watch the ladies come to have their dresses fitted and I would watch them walk away feeling better with their chin up and their shoulders back and feeling a bit special and seeing how my mother had disguised their flaws and the transition between how they arrived and wanted their frock and left having said I want to look better than Mrs O'Brien <laughs> and walking out looking amazing and, and with a little bit more so so I just took those two things and married them and, and so you've got that landscape of Dungata and the rural community and the couture against that. And was your experience the experience of growing up in a small, very stifling kind of community like that where everybody knew everybody else's business? Absolutely. Um, I was born and raised in a small community of 800 people um, and everybody knew everything. We knew all the secrets that we shouldn't have known, but we knew which secrets to keep and which ones to tell. Uh, we knew that the equilibrium must be maintained. But in that, that small community, uh, you did know all the secrets and you knew some things you really shouldn't have known, but you also felt a great sense of comfort and security and there were uh, unity and the, the people around you were always very loyal. And were there lots of occasions when you talk about you know wanting one woman wanting to look better than Mrs O'Brien? Mm. What were the occasions then in a small rural community where you would get the chance to show off and dress up? Because I mean, it's not like the glamour of the city, no. is it? The Catholic ball, right? The football ball, uh, the CWA functions, Rotary Club, Lions Club. Because uh, when I was a weddings, kid, I suppose. weddings, weddings, weddings were big, you know. Um, and back in, back when I was a kid, it was a vibrant, thriving farming community, and the town sang. You know, it really was quite a hip and happening place. Um, and so there were quite a lot of occasions, but sadly, that's not the, the case anymore mm. so much. No, mm. it's not. Mm. Now, tell us a little bit about this amazing creature that is Tilly Dunnage. Mm. Mm. How on earth did you come up with someone? She's so complex in her kind of dark, troubling and troubled sort of personality. Mm. I mean, she's obviously cooking up revenge for some things that happened to her mm. in Dangata in her childhood. But there are other moments when we see a kind of softer side to her. Mm. Mm. Um, Tilly Dunnage, I think the, the nucleus of Tilly Dunnage was the bus that came to Geraldry and dropped people off and left them standing there. And those people could either be good or bad or otherwise. Some were shuffled out of town quite quickly, others stayed forever. Um, and I just always had an image of a girl getting off a bus with a suitcase at that time. So there was the sense of mystery. Um, the fact that she could sew was the source for the people to turn from disliking the outsider to liking her. But also when you're writing a novel and it's your first novel, you want tragedy. Mm. And so who better than an impossibly beautiful heroine with a tragic past that was somewhat rather a victim? And of course there's lies and gossip and malice. And so you add that to Tilly Dun Dunnage with the sewing machine and you have vanity. And there you have it. But in order for her to be likeable, she, she has to be softer on some level. And I kept her soft on those levels and I kept her not purposely vindictive. It was She just accommodated the demise 
of the town's people they did it themselves so i in in the course that i was writing where i was writing this book they were just the elements that i thought would make quite a good story and i just put them in and it worked it mm. certainly did and now in a kind of sort of fairy tale element mm-hmm. the book has been adapted for the screen after a long delay after mm. lots of false starts finally there's going to be a film with Kate Winslet and Judy Davis and an absolutely stellar cast. And you have been absolutely there on mm. set, mm. not just observing for a fabulous blog that you've written about the film, but you've actually appeared in the film. So tell me what it's been like to see this whole world of yours, of your imagination, brought to life, and then what it's been like to step onto the set and be an extra in your own mm. book. Mm. Well, the first decision I made was that they they would make the film. It would be their film, um, and I would hand it over, and I would enjoy it as an extra and just enjoy the experience of being an extra because if you're going to be an extra once and the only time in your life, you may as well do it with Judy Davis and Kate Winslet and Hugo Weaving, um, Liam Hemsworth, Rebecca Gibney, all those sorts of people. So I thought, all right, I will do that. Um, and then I just let Sue Maslin and Jocelyn Morehouse do the whole thing. It was amazing. It was amazing for me and my friends and family to be fitted for costumes um, and get terribly excited about that. But then getting off a bus in the township of Dungatar was just something that you just don't forget. And then I, I got off into the town that I'd created in my mind and it wasn't that different The township wasn't that different. I felt actually quite at home. And then, of course, Muriel Pratt came and spoke to me and Elspeth Beaumont came up and spoke to me. And I don't know. Characters in your own mind came and spoke to you. They did. (laughs) They did. And it was quite surreal. And the thing that was lovely about it is that they were at work. And so they were in character. And they were talking to me as Elspeth Beaumont or as Muriel Pratt. I mean, they were slip back into being Rebecca Gibney and Caroline Goodall but for the sake of research they just they, I don't know how they knew who I was but it was entirely surreal and extremely glorious. And was your biggest sort of pinch me moment the moment when you danced with Hugo Weaving? It was mm. because I didn't expect that. <laughs> I think I might have been sitting there talking to you at that time. I possibly. did come on set and yes. I did witness that for myself and yes. you did have the look on your face of the cat that's got the cream. Oh my goodness gracious me and I didn't I hadn't practiced much but I knew that I couldn't mess up. I knew that I had to get it perfectly right and I don't know what it is there's something in you that goes okay I cannot mess this up and I just somehow went through the whole process and I think that had a bit to do with the fact that when Hugo Weaving put his hand out and looked at me as Sergeant Farrett my favorite cross-dresser on the planet yes I just kind of went look at me <laughs> dancing with Sergeant Farrett and so I just thought, I just decided to enjoy it and, and have a very lovely time. And, and it, it was really good. It is, of course, masterly casting that yes. with his association with Priscilla, mm. we get him as a cross-dressing policeman. And, mm. um, yeah, I can't wait to see what his, what his particular outfits look like. Yes. What is your favourite outfit in the film, either that you wear or that Kate Winslet wears? What's the frock for you that embodies everything about the couture and the fantasy um, that Tilly Dunnage brings to Dungatar. There's um, a dress that Sarah Snook wears that's black and it's got a sun spray kind of cape attached to it that is just amazing. It's just a little bit, it's, it's like a basic black dress but ridiculously flamboyant at the same time. There's a wonderful black dress that Kate Winslet wears to the football that I really, really enjoy. But the, but the, I think the, the, the costumes that Marion Boyce has made, which are the ones that Tilly would have made for the townspeople, are just glorious. And they're exactly the right thing to juxtapose against an outback, you know, barren um, Australian bush landscape. And I also think that the, Kate, the clothes that Kate Winslet wore were entirely suitable for her role as well. I just thought all of them were spectacularly wonderful. And I had a gorgeous dress too, 
which tragically I can't wear because I was in a corset and I needed two people to get me into the corset and out of the corset. So it's at home now for me to look at and think, gosh, that was a lovely day I wore that. <laughs> mm. So were you at all starstruck when you came face to face with Kate Winslet? No, I wasn't. I wasn't because I'd, I'd schooled myself and told myself just to be entirely sensible. And she seemed like such a normal person. She was a very normal person. And she spoke to me about the book. Mm. And she that was very grounding and, and enormously flattering for me that she would talk about the book and the, and the attributes of Tilly um, and the relationship with Molly, all those sorts of Molly things. Molly being her mother. That's Molly being the Judy a, Davis Judy character. Davis. And so I was, you know, I'd, I looked at the cast and thought, right, now you've just got to be very sensible and grown up about this. And I was very proud of myself, I was. Mm. <laughs> yes, because I think a lot of people would have been just completely overwhelmed by having having a book that they had sort of conceived, made real, and then see that mm. kind of firepower being brought to it is, is pretty remarkable. It is pretty remarkable. We had been on set for quite a few days by the time we actually met them and we were getting jaded. Oh, right. <laughs> now, the New York Times pointed out one of the things that it liked most about your, um, your original novel was the language of dressmaking and of the fabrics. Yes and the materials, and I was just wondering whether there was a particular word or a particular description of fabric that you particularly enjoyed, because obviously that vocabulary is very rich mm. and very sensual. You can almost feel the dresses rustling around you on mm. the page as you read about them. That, that again comes from my childhood, and that comes from my mother, <coughs> pardon me, and it comes from the sound of pinking shears on a wooden table, which I think is a universal sound. I think most people recognise that sound. The sound of tearing not or ripping, tearing for one sort of material, ripping for another, the lighter, more satiny sorts of material. Words like flock, you know, they sound like as they are. So when you say the word flock, you can see the flock and the fragments in the shaft of sunlight coming down. It's, it's a very sensuous thing. And then there's a sort of a quiet focus when you're moulding a piece of fabric to someone's body and the, the pins in the mouth. You know, it's, it just seems like a ritual. That, that the, and there's a communication between the person being fitted and the person fitting. And they just the person being fitted just seems to be able to raise their arm and do whatever the seamstress is doing. And it's all focused, of course, on the window, the, the mirror in front of them. It's a wonderful thing to watch. It is, and there is such an intimacy there because, as mm. you say, you're dealing with the body while you're pinning and fitting, but um, there is also an opportunity there for a very private kind of little moment of conversation, yes. which can sometimes mm. be quite confessional. Mm. Mm. Yes, I, there was a few things that I did here as I held the pin tin for my mother. For example, I'd like to look much nicer than Mrs. O'Brien. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and my mother saying, perhaps we'll just move the sleeve down a little bit, cover up that line of tan there, you know, which was a subtle suggestion to do with the top of the arm, which isn't the most attractive part of the anatomy on some people. Things like that, and I thought that were, it was very interesting. Let's just raise the darts a little bit, shall we? Mm -hmm. Bring the waist up a little bit for the slight protrusion that some people have down there. <laughs> Things like that. It was all very, you know, intimate. And yeah, all the breasts, the whole thing around breasts and where they should be and how to dress the breast too is something that's I've remembered. Mm. Yes, it's obviously stayed with you very, yes. very powerfully. Yes. Um, you give the impression in the in the town of Dungata that there is no one there who is in any way, I have to say, normal or doesn't have some kind of secret obsession mm. or fetish. Um, is that your experience, that really everybody is harbouring some seething kind of dark, you know? If they haven't... If they're not, then someone will invent one. <laughs> it's just like, because you know so much about everybody, there's always some little thing that the wall, I know about that, you know, there's some sort of secret that can be both ammunition and the Achilles heel. But, but most people are perfectly normal, lovely people just going about their lives. Um, 
there's a lack of entertainment in some small communities. So there's a need to create a story mm. or create an event around an occurrence. Uh, it just provides some sort of social and an emotional valve that can go up and down or there's something like that. But most people are very lovely and very normal. But because it's a small community and you do know everything, it's very hard to hide a secret. And it's also equally hard to die and be forgotten. Someone will notice that you're missing. So there's the, the pros and the cons mm. of it. Mm, absolutely. Mm. The, the close-knit thing can also be very supportive, I guess. Very, very. And lots of fun when it mm. comes to putting on amateur dramatics, which, of course, is the great sort of climax of the book. And um, I mm. won't give away too much about what happened there, but um, I think it's very much what the stylish reader will be wearing this season. Thank you very much, Rosalie. Oh, thank Hamm. you. Thank you.